So in this example, we have archaeologists at WSU did an extensive summer excavation at Burnt Mesa Pueblo in Bandelier National Monument. Their work is published in the book Bandelier Archaeological Excavation Project Summer 1990, Excavations at Burnt Mesa Pueblo and Casa del Rito, edited by T.A. Kohler. Um, one question that the archaeologists archaeologist asked was, is raw material used by prehistoric Indians for stone tool manufacturing independent of the archaeological site excavation? Um, the two different excavation sites at Burnt Mesa Pueblo gave the information in the table below, and they would like us to use a chi-square test with a 5% level of significance to test the claim that the raw material used for construction of stone material, stone tools and excavation sites are independent. Um, so the first thing I want to make the comment about is what kind of analysis are we doing? That's kind of obvious in this case. It says use the chi-squared test. Um, if it didn't say that, it would talk about independence. So either one of those two words should tell you that this is a chi-squared test. For independence. All right, that being the case, Here's our data. So there were 731 um, stone tools made out of basalt at site A. There were 93 stone tools made out of obsidian at site B and so forth. And what they want to know is were they able to actually say that site A and site B, um, even though it's called the test for independence, we're actually trying to show dependence between these two things. We want to know if Knowing what site they used, we can say what kind of material they used. It's basically what they're looking for. So it comes to our first step of every hypothesis test is to state the hypotheses. So in this case, the raw material used for construction of stone material and excavation sites, again, that's what we're trying to do is see are the materials used and the site independent of each other. I realize this is called the test for independence, but you are not trying to prove independence. You are actually trying to prove dependence. It's a poorly named um, duh, hypothesis test. HA, the raw material used for construction of stone tools and excavation sites are dependent. So again, that's really what we're trying to show is that there's a dependency so that we can say if we're at site A, then we most likely used this type of material. Um, these are written out in words because there really isn't an easy way to write symbols. Usually our first step of every hypothesis test is to state the random variables and parameters, but this test is really about qualita qualitative data, and then we just count it up from the qualitative data, so it really isn't um, easy to write down those things. So we just write our hypotheses in words, um, and of course the last thing to do is always write down your um, level of significance. In this case it's 5%. So alpha is 0 0.05. The next step of every hypothesis test is the requirements check. So um, in this case, we do, as normal, have a random sample of material type and site location is taken. Um, they didn't actually specify that in this problem, so, but we can assume it is because they did a study conducted by scientists in the field. Most likely they did some kind of method to actually get a random sample. The other one is that the other assumption behind a chi-squared test for independence is that all expected values are at least 5. Um, we don't know that yet because we don't know what the expected values are. These values here are the observed values. These are what we observe to happen. We have to find the expected values, so we can't actually answer this question yet until we've actually calculated the expected values. So we'll come back to this. Notice I actually already said that they all were because I do know they are, but let's go ahead and we'll come back to this and worry about it later. So let's go to the calculation step. Um, I put the chart here again just to help us remember what the numbers were. Again, these are all observed values. What we want to do is come up with the expected values. One thing you will need is the row total and a column total. So we're going to add those to our chart. All right, so when we add up all of these numbers, we find out that there were 1,428 different items collected from site A, and there were 1,296 items collected from site B. Um, we also know that there were 1,315 items that were basalt, 
195 items that were obsidian, 1,035 that were perennial chet, chert, and the last one is there was 179 that was some other material that wasn't specified. And altogether, there were 2,724 different items that were included. The reason we need that, that was that um, it helps us to come up with the expected values. So we want to find the expected value um, for each one of these um, numbers in our chart, so each one of these cells. The expected value turns out to be the row total times the column total divided by the total, the grand total. So if we want to know the expected value for this number right here, then we would use its row total, which is this number of 1,315, um, 1, and its column total of 1,428. So for this one right here, for the 731, its expected value would be 1,315 times 1,428, and then you divide that by the total of 2,724. Turns out that number is 689.36. Um, instead of doing each one of these, I'm just going to actually write it up in here into the cell that I just found. Now, to do the next cell, I would, let's say we do the 540, 584 cell. That would be the row total of 1,315 times the column total of 1,296. Again, you multiply these two numbers together and then divide by the total. And that one turns out to be 625.64. Now let's go back, go to the 102. The 102 would be the 195. Um, divided times the 1,428, and then divided by, again, the grand total. So that gives us a total, in this case, of 102.22. Then we're going to do the exact same thing for the 93. The 93 has a row total of 195, a column total of 1,296. Multiply those two numbers together, divide by the grand total, and you come up with 92.788. Then we'll go to the 510. The 510 is in the row of 1,035 and the column of 1,428. Multiply those two numbers together, divide by the grand total, and when you do that you get 542.58. Then we'll do the same thing with the 525. The 525 is in the row with 1,035 and the column with 1,296. Multiply those two numbers together, divide by the grand total, and you end up with 492.42. And then the last row, we have an 85. 85 is in the row of 179, and the column of 1,428. Again, multiply those two numbers together, divide by the grand total, and you end up with 93. 0.84. And then the last one is in the row of 179 and the column of 1,296. Multiply those two numbers together, divide by your grand total, and you end up with 85.16. This is why I was able to say back in the assumptions that my um, all of my expected values were greater than 5 because you could see every single one of these eight numbers is bigger than 5. All right, so now we can actually go ahead and calculate our test statistic. The main thing to understand here with the test statistic is we want to see how far away are the observed from what we expected to have happen. So if we want to know how far away the observed are from the expected, it makes more sense to just subtract the observed minus the expected. So we're going to actually do this in columns. It's way easier to do this in a column setting than to do it in um, a formula setting. So we had 731 
we had 584. These are all of your observed values. We had an observed value of 102, an observed value of 93, an observed value of 510, an observed value of 525, an observed value of 85, and an observed value of 94. The corresponding expected values that we just finished calculating were 689.36, 625, 102.22, 92.78, 542.58, 492.48, 493.84, and the last one was 85.16. So now what we're going to do is we're going to actually do observed minus expected. So we're going to take each of our observed values, subtract off its corresponding expected value. The first one I get 41.64. The next one I get negative 41.64. Um, the next one gives me a negative 0 0.22. The next one gives me a positive 0.22. The next set gives me a negative 32.58. The next one gives me a positive 32.58. Um, the last set gives me a negative 8.84 and positive 8.84 for the last one. Um, it is a coincidence that they all end up this way, but it turns out a lot of times they end up nicely where you have these pairs. Sometimes you don't get them. But one of the things you're going to notice if I add this column up, I get zero. So that doesn't really help me very much because that tells me that the total is zero, which doesn't really give me any insights into what's happening. So we're going to actually create another column here. The reason for the zeros is the negative signs. So one way to get rid of negative signs is to square them. So we're going to square each of these values. So the top number squared is 177, sorry, 1733.8896. Uh, the next one will also be 1733.8896. Um, the next one is 0 0.0484, and so we're the one after that. Um, the next one is 1061.4564, and also 1061.4564. And the last two are 78.1456 and 78.1456. Now these numbers are just big. Some of them are big because the expected value was just big. So the way we kind of get rid of that largeness is we divide by each of the corresponding expected values. So I would take this 1733.8896 and divide it by 689.36. When I do that I get 2.51 Five, two. You can keep going with decimal places, but we'll just stop at some point here. Um, the better to keep many decimal places, but for this, this example, we'll go ahead and cut them off just for the video. Um, you're then going to take the next number, 1733.8896, and divide it by its expected value of 625.64. When I do that, I get 2.7714. Then I'm going to take the 0 0.0484 divided by 102.22. That gives me 0 0.0005. And then I'm going to do the same thing with the next one. Divide this 0 0.484 by its expected value of 92.78. Gives me 0 0.0005. Um, these are not the same. This is actually 5.2 and this one's actually 4.7, but rounded off they're about the same. Um, take the next two, the next one 1061.4564, divide that by 520, 542.58 um, and that will give me 1.9563 and then the next grouping would give me 2.1556 and then the last two dividing each of these values by their corresponding expected number gives me 0 0.8328 
and the last one is 0 0.9176. We're actually almost there. If we were to add up this last column here, this last column adds up to roughly 11.1499. And that's actually your chi-squared value. So that's actually your test statistic. So we've got their test statistic. Now we need our p-value. Um, I need a little bit of space here, so let me move these down just a tiny bit. Okay. So we need to get our p-value. A um, chi-squared is always a right-tailed test. So your p-value will always be the probability of getting a chi-squared bigger than the one you just calculated. Um, you can get this value no matter which technology you use. If you're using the calculator, if you're using um, the R, you're using some other thing. Um, this example will show using the calculator. So you'd go into your dister menu and get the chi-squared CDF. You're starting is 11.1499 and you are shading everything to the right so that would be 1E99 and then the last thing we need to know is the degrees of freedom so the degrees of freedom in a chi-squared test is always equal to the number of rows minus 1 times the number of columns minus 1 so going back up to our chart here we had originally three rows, I'm sorry, four rows, and two columns. So we would have this be four minus one times two minus one. So the degrees of freedom happens to be three. So you'd put a three here. Um, you would then ask the calculator what that is or whatever technology you're using, and you get 0 0.0109. So there's our p-value that corresponds to this test statistic. Now we can get to our conclusion. Again, in every hypothesis test, you either reject HO or fail to reject HO. Um, if your p-value is bigger than your alpha, you fail to reject. If your p-value is smaller than your alpha, you reject. In this case, our p-value is smaller than our alpha, so we will, in fact, reject HO. And now we get to our interpretation. Again, since you rejected HO, that means you do have enough evidence to show HA. So there is enough evidence to support, well, what did HA say? So let's go back and look at HA. HA says that the raw materials used for construction of stone tools and the excavation site are dependent. So that's what we're going to write here. So there is enough evidence to support that the stone tool construction and the excavation Are dependent. Um, that was at the 5% level, so I should have said there is enough evidence at the 5% level to support this. Um, that means that the scientists now can use this fact um, to say, and I'm sorry, I can't seem to spell tool. Apologize for that. Um, so the scientists can now use the fact that they are dependent to say, okay, if they use basalt, they are from this site, or if they used a combination of different items, they are from this site. So this is why scientists like this.